So George, help me understand a little bit. Uh, I'm having lenders that are telling me about a one-year rule, and then my real estate agent is telling me about a two-year rule. What is the one-year and the two-year rule thing, and how does that help me? Well, this is a good place to get the information on here. The one-year rule is more or less how you can help yourself build a rental port property portfolio, and the two-year rule is how you can do that without paying any capital gains taxes. So thanks for coming into the creditjungle.com today. This is George Anderson. George, George, George of the jungle, strong as he can be. And let's just go ahead and address these because they're really not related to each other, but yet they kind of are depending on what you want to do with your home ownership and maybe you are looking at getting some rental properties over the course of time. So the one year rule basically says this. It says that in the absence of being transferred for work or relocated or doing something that would put you, if you're staying within a 100 mile radius of where you are right now, you can do one primary residence transaction on a mortgage loan every 12 months. So let's just say, for example, somebody bought a home and they say that, okay, great, I'm gonna live in this home for a little bit. And I've got a client that has done this on two previous homes and he's on his third one right now. Bought a home, finished the basement, started renting out the basement, had a rental history there, goes back to this ADU model that we were talking about in a, pre in a previous video, and then moved out and then now had two different sources of rental income on this house and then went and bought another house with an unfinished basement so that he could do that again and then a third house to be able to do that. Well, what are the time frames that you need to have between house one, house two, and house three? So you need to be able to do that. You can't do it at more than uh, once every 12 months. But just sit and think about this. The first house that this person purchased Okay, he now has up and down rental income that's giving him a nice healthy cash flow on that property. He can use some of that income to go and get a mortgage loan on another property on a conventional loan with as little as 5% down because he's already had this home for 12 months or one year. So now he can do a second primary residence owner occupied loan that has lower down payment, better interest rate, more flexibility on the debt to income ratios and everything else. So now you're getting good terms again on the second home, finish the basement, get rental from upstairs and downstairs, and now you've got technically four different streams of income from two properties, and now you can go ahead and do it on the third. And you can do that process every year up until you have 10 mortgages in your name. Now, if you're doing it, there's a little carve out there that if you're doing it as a primary residence, there's an exception in there but you start running into some other underwriting issues that you're gonna bump into. And you know what, maybe having two or three properties is enough. But anyway, that one year rule applies to the time frame, the minimum time frame between taking out a primary residence loan. So what is the two year rule? So the two year rule now becomes your capital gains exemption. And the way that it's written into the IRS code is that once you've lived in a home for at least two years, and occupied it as your primary residence. As a single person, you can sell that home and have as much as a $250,000 capital gain as an individual or as a married couple, it's double that, it's a half a million dollar exemption. So if you bought your home for 300,000 and then at the end of two years, you decided to sell the home, okay? Well, if you had it for two years as your primary residence and you sold that home for 550, you bought it for 300, sell for 550. I'm not going to get into all of the little adjustments on there for any improvements you made to the loan or to the home or expenses for selling the home. But roughly that $250,000 there, that's tax-free money. If you were married, you could have sold that home for $700,000 or I'm sorry, $800,000 bought it for 300, sell it for 800, you can take a half a million dollar capital gains and it's tax free on there. Now, let's go back to our guy that was buying a home, then buying a home and buying a home. Well, what happens as soon as you rent out that house? Well, here's the thing, is that if you're only in that home for one year and then decided to buy another home, okay, you can go ahead and pick up the other home, 
but this first home, let's just say you decided to sell that home sometime down the road. Uh, let's just say you wanted to sell it within the last five years. The IRS is going to determine your qualification for the capital gains exemption based on whether or not you've lived in that home for two of the last five years. Well, in this case, you only lived in the home for one year and then you built, bought this home, you lived in this home for one year and then you converted it to a rental and now you're in your third home. So if you don't want to go and move back and to live in this house for another year again, if you were to sell this home or this home, any home that you have not occupied as your primary residence for two of the last five years, that home will be subject to capital gains tax. You will not have that exemption on there. So this is something that when I'm taking a loan application with somebody, I ask them these questions. I say, well, what's your intention with this home? Is this a home that you would like to keep? Maybe, especially if you've got a younger couple and they're buying a condo or a town home or they're buying maybe a, a smaller home with maybe two bedrooms, two baths, and they've got kids and maybe thinking about having another one or who knows how many down the road. It's good to find that out. And I explain that capital gains exemption to them and how it can work for their advantage and if they got into this house with a low down payment and a good interest rate, if they don't need all of their equity out of this house to get into the next one, maybe this house would be a good candidate to keep as a rental property or something that you could convert into an accessory dwelling unit in there. So these are all just tools in the toolbox here that are not necessarily underwriting guidelines, but this is more of a home buying strategy and how to develop uh, and build a real estate portfolio. But not only that, but how to preserve your net worth. Okay, if you can save money, just sit and think about, tell me a, a better way that you could get a half a million dollars of tax-free income than buying a house, making improvements on it, let the market go up, and then allow you to sell that home. And if you lived in the home for 10 years or 20, whatever it is, as long as you've lived in it for two of the last five, when you sell that home as a married couple, $500,000 of the gain is tax free. So keep this stuff in mind. And if you have some questions, give me a call, push button, get mortgage professional. And I'd be happy to discuss these strategies with you and how you can make your home buying experience, not just putting a roof over your head for your family, but actually part of your strategic plan for retirement and saving some money in, for, in taxes along the way. Talk to you soon and have a great day. Bye bye. George, George, George of the jungle strong as he can be.